talk a little bit about the, the diversity. But I was, you know, I was fluffing around looking at some uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics stats and I was sort of looking at some numbers. And I already knew these numbers, but just looking at them sort of really, really made me wonder what it is we're trying to do here. I haven't populated this graph here. Does anyone even hazard a guess? Uh, this is for Australian in the 25 to 65 year old age bracket or something like that. If anyone hazard a guess, what percentage of people have some sort of vocational? Qualification in 2011 or whatever. Does anyone even hazard a guess? 30. 30? 30? 30? Yes, that's, that, that's 30, 40? It's, well, it's a good guess. Across that range. <laughs> and pretty static over that period of time. And I don't have the most up to date figures, but uh, do flat lines there for 20 odd years. Um, what percentage of Australians um, have a higher end qualification, do you think, today, 2011, most recently? Anyone hazard a guess? 25, about 25, yeah. What was it 20 years before that?
see me that I'm an extrovert. I'm a dude who knows heaps and heaps about chemistry. And they want to hear from me. And they're paying thousands of dollars a year to go to university to listen to experts or to, or to try and somehow absorb the knowledge and, and to learn the way that experts have learned. So I still think there is a place for, for someone up the front of the room, um, you know, sharing their expertise and sharing their knowledge. Now, if it's someone just standing here at the lectern, just going from a slide to slide, that is not what I'm talking about. But, you know, an engaging lecture, I think, can be a fascinating thing. But more to the point, I think, you know, we, we, we're somewhere on a continuum, aren't we? So at one end of the spectrum, we might have a didactic, didactic lecture. At the other end of the continuum is where it's completely student-led. It's interactive. There are students in the classroom doing some problem solving over here. Um, engaging with each other, uh, working on a case study, or whatever it is that they're doing. And you can be somewhere on that continuum. And so the argument that I would put is that I have three timetable lectures per week. I should be doing a little bit of all of those things across the three hours. And maybe sometimes for 15 minutes, I'm at this end of the spectrum. Because I've got some really important stuff to say, and they want to hear an expert talking about it. But then, maybe later in that class, we slide down to the other end. So I, I don't didactic is this naughty word in university education um, for the passionate students. Uh, so there's a bit of flip stuff going on. So um, I make these crappy videos in chemistry using this very laptop. I've got some software attached to it. I basically take um, a small slide deck and I sit in my office, or as I was on the weekend now, staring at you know, my house, making these. You can hear the birds in the background sort of chirping around this bit. <laughs> Um, I'll make these videos, and so I try to put in a bit of a work, a work kind of model for our chemistry, chemistry students. Watch a video, do some sort of pre-lecture activity, there's nothing new about it, it's not unique to me, we've been doing it all over the world, but this, I've, I've tried to build this in. Um, and uh, the thing I like about it, chemistry is very technical, there's lots of you know, lingo and, and new jargon and terminology, just to break the ice by embedding that terminology pre-lecture video, then they might do a couple of quiz on my quiz questions. Then when they hear you say hybridisation in a lecture, they've actually heard that phrase before. And perhaps they're, they have the picture in their mind already because they saw it a few days in the video. We then have a post-lecture test, and this is kind of a fortnightly cycle to try and get the students into it. So if you like, it's, it's uh, somewhere on the, on the description of flip learning. Um, just a few more of those buzzwords I've, I've picked out, um, and this is this is something that um, I'd like to use those words to describe what goes on in my lectures as well. So my lectures aren't just didactic. They're dynamic, and I don't mean that I'm just sort of kind of being flamboyant and waving my arms in the air, because I don't think that makes for a great learning experience necessarily either. You can have some really good presenters. It doesn't mean that there's a great learning experience. You know, it's got to be interactive. Um, in chemistry, animation is really useful because, you know, chemistry is very hard to visualise, so there is a lot of that. Um, live inking or digital inking, you know, I've got one of these tablets and, and I can kind of, you know, scribble all over the screen if I you know, bring a pen on and, you know, draw, draw things and, you know, but more seriously, you know, draw chemistry and, you know, some hard concepts for students to get so you can, you can bring your otherwise boring PowerPoint presentation to life with some sort of degree. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I've got, um, so I'm just going to jump out of the, I don't keep those annotations. I did have a, a short video. So actually out of three lecture spots per week, we, we call one of them a workshop, but I would call it a workshop. Um, and we like to bring in, oh, sorry, my computer's misbehaving. Just bear with me for a second. I'm trying to bring these lectures to life. Um, is there anything up there yet? Oh, I don't know, I'll skip that. I had a little video of some um, of uh, some of the demonstrations that we do in our lectures, but uh, if I've got time, I'll come, I'll come back to that. So I mentioned these short videos that I make. Um, you know what? They're actually quite crappy, and you really do hear the birds in the background, and you really do hear me clearing my throat, and you hear me um, uh, making mistakes. And you might get all that stuff in. These things are not mandatory. They're not slick. Okay. And you know what? The students prefer it that way. You know, when they when they hear my now deceased Prof Hill in the background singing <laughs> to hybridisation. <laughs> you know, it's kind of real, and they do like that for some sort of learning experience. Um, all of these things these days are embedded on YouTube because, let's face it, um, you, 
YouTube works on any computer device you could probably imagine. I see the phones, I see the laptops, I see the tablets. You know, YouTube is designed so that in the fractions, it's um, you know, designed to sell in people's first places. So YouTube works. When I make these videos, I convert them all to YouTube and I link them to the movie page. I don't think they're actually watching, you know, uh, sort of like Chris's little videos, but you know, it's all just payouts. In, um, in YouTube, they're incredibly popular. Okay, so they report back um, in droves to accept you and all sorts of feedback that they like these things. I have the pre lecture videos, by the way, and then I have an entire library, which is basically the, the whole curriculum. So you can do first year chemistry just by watching all these short bite sized videos. This one here, I think, is 30 minutes. Actually, I try to keep them from 5 to 10. Again, nothing new about it. People do this all over the place. Not my idea. An idea I've, I've picked up on. We have tutorials in chemistry as well, and um, they report um, in droves that this is the best learning experience that they have. Believe it or not, we didn't have tutorials in chemistry until a couple of years ago. So we brought those back in. Um, prior to that, it was just dead by PowerPoint, three hours a week. Okay. Now we have these interactive lectures. We're doing chemistry up at the front, but it's not just um, party tricks. We hand out problem solving apps. And after they've seen some of this party trick up the front, let me spend the next 30 minutes working through some um, problems to explain the chemistry that they just saw up the front. Okay, otherwise, to be honest with you, it's just party tricks. And they do that in a, some of you may have heard of Pogel, but it's, if you like, it's just an interactive fun format. In classrooms like this, in fact, very good ones, and they just chat to each other. It's brilliant. But we have these small group tutorials as well, which they absolutely we do some other sort of strange stuff in chemistry. Um, there's a guy called Felix Novus. I don't know if anyone here knows Felix. He's in the Centre for um, Perform Performance Art, I think is what it's called. Um, and we collaborated to, to, to roll out this so-called performing elements um, activity. We're into our third year. So you know, someone came to me and said, oh, you know, someone called Warwick, and we've got this relationship with Warwick University. Oh, we get our students to do this thing in performing arts and chemistry. And uh, you know, I instantly thought, oh, so, you know, they want our students to, you know, wander around the room and pretend to be molecules. That's going to go down really well. Um, no, it was, it's actually nothing like that at all. It's really exploring chemistry through storytelling. And every year for the last three years, we've had about 30 students sign up for this activity and collaboration between Felix and myself. Um, so the students, as I say, students opt in to the program. Um, so they don't, a lot of students will there's a whole bunch that are serious about it. A lot of our education does in chemistry is looking for different ways and new ways for communicating science and communicating chemistry. And so we rolled this out and the students just uh, absolutely go crazy for it. So it's, it's a little bit different and after being pretty cynical at first, um, this is, uh, we've, we've put actually got a grant around this for writing publications on this stuff as well. So by being a little bit of thinking outside the box, there's all sorts of things that you can do. Um, all I've really done today is just a little bit of show and tell about what I'm doing in chemistry. Okay, your cohorts are going to be different. Okay, but you will have substantial diversity in there. And I just ask people to think a little bit outside the box and think about why well, can't I do some of those things to make sure I'm somehow getting to every single student. Because some are going to come to your lectures and they'll probably learn lots, but we we know that the thing is they're not going to come. They're going to try and engage with content in different. Um, so, so you know, that, that's just, this is just my case study. I hope perhaps you guys can draw on something like that. A few acknowledgements. Um, someone in particular who's been really, uh, really useful for me in terms of my development has been Joy Wheaton. So thanks, Joy, helping me apply for teaching awards at the HER program. Um, my mentor is part of the HER program, and my deputy dean, so I'm deputy dean first. But no, she's been fantastic. Uh, Christina Parsavsky, my ADE, Dad Paganin. Um, But also, my colleagues and my students, okay, because they put up with some stuff. And I didn't tell you about the shit that didn't work. <laughs> They're very tolerant of my students. But um, no, but quite seriously, thank you. Anyway, I'll take a stop. Thank you. Thank you.
pressure. That's a little bit more blur. You see, you see where I'm going? How are they going to give evidence at the interview that they can do that? Well, we have to give them some opportunity. That's our role. So what I start with is no one is going to fail in this unit. Believe me, there is a Unless you really don't play the game. When I say really, it's really, really don't play the game. Like, you know, you know, you know what you're saying, I don't care at all, sorry, I'm tired. So it doesn't happen. They all, they all pass because they deserve to pass. Forget about the mark, as you have ever conceptualized it. It's going to be very different. It's not the 60%, 70%, or 80% even on the final exam. It's 1%, 1%, 1%, 5%, 1%, 1%, 3%. It's all little chunks of things that you have to do all every single day of an exam. Um, I'm your coach. Take advantage of this. What is there for you? These units give you opportunities to gain relevant, authentic work experience. That's something that they need when they apply for, for something, for a job. They need that, and they can't say that they got that during their academic year. Well, this is what we provide here. Um, and you need to discover, invent, create your professional self. That's all what it is about. How do you want to behave when you are professional? Well, try it. Try it here. You have this opportunity. So for you to develop competencies, it's not just knowledge. It's about competencies as well. And what is there for you as well is about the assessment are not just, not meaningful assessment. The assessment are tools that they are going to develop themselves that are going to be used in their real life. There is an incentive here. If I do it well, I bring it in my, my job, I bring it in my interview and I show them, well, that's what I've, I've done and it's really, really good for them to have that. So you will be trained. It's not just knowledge, it's also training through systematic and rigorous scientific methodology with all the tools. So is it only words? No. Um, industry placement, I take care of that. I got all these people and more um, as a network, and industries contact me when they want to hire a graduate. So the students know that. I've placed about 50 students this way, um, and they know that, and they now put me as a referee in their CV. So what do you want, when I, I ask them, when you're, you're going to put me as a referee, what do you want me to tell these guys when they call me? Think about it and show me you have an entire semester to show me what you want me to say to them when they call me. It can be me, it can be someone else, it doesn't matter. Construct yourself as a professional. You're going to improve your employability. And these units provide you with opportunities to build these, these skills. <coughs> Working teams, challenges, initiatives, make decisions. Outside your comfort zone is the master word. They are all going to be outside their comfort zone. Get ready. Guess what? This is the same in the real world anyway. So let's start now instead of taking the slap in one year time. <laughs> what if you make the wrong decision? Initiatives, mistakes are allowed. We don't care. Trusting environment is another master word here. As a teacher, as a coach, you have to build a trusting environment. You can't do other. First, first thing that, that goes aside and, and they are not happy, everybody, okay, it's easy for me to talk to them anymore. Every second that's spent in class is to build the assessment. So the more you, so you work on it, the better your mark is going to be. Because they are very receptive to that thing. And we have to build a very flexible environment in that kind of, of situation. So 
o'clock because they haven't finished and they are afraid not to finish on the Friday. They said, oh, you're begging me. So, big story, obviously. Um, so we prep for the, we prepare for the prac, we run the prac for an entire week, and then we interpret the prac and we assess the prac. That's all about the prac. Because this is the prac that they are going to do in the real life. So, each resource is created as an assignment, is submitted, reviewed by peers and teachers, and submitted again. <coughs> so this is another way of them taking advantage and taking care of the, the feedback that we can give them. Very important aspect here. They submit, give them feedback, and they can submit again. So they give you the, your, their best shot. Not sure I have time, no I don't. So this, this is my Google, Google site. Moodle is really important in that kind of um, experiential learning thing. It, it can't really be normal Moodle with just uploading a, a few things. It has to be a little bit more thought about. So every single of these um, little icons lead to a lesson, what is called a lesson in, in Moodle, and they have to go through the lesson um, for each of these activities here. And this is all plus. Tablet manufacturing, same kind of, of setting. Um, this is uh, an entire semester of activities, so everything is in there, and everything is in, related in books behind all these icons. The first line is, is um, writing a book. Students are exposed to a problem. You have to develop a tablet. How are you going to do that? They look for information, and instead of just giving me the information, they write a book. We actually write it, we, we edit it, and we have a, a physical book like you can see here. So even the students are really happy when they get the book. I'm getting really happy when I see it. And all the rest of it is about saying, doing the experiments and then analyzing and interpreting. <coughs> I've got another unit where we have actual real problems for industry. They come to me and they say, oh, develop this, whatever, micro function for something. And all the students talk to their mentor. It's not me anymore. I'm not here anymore. I'm just coaching try to find out if it works well, but I have no idea. And the students, it's really great because they, they start to say, oh, Laurence, do you know? Also? No, you don't know anyway. No, I don't know anything about what you're doing. I'm a pharmacist. I, I, I pharmacist assigns everything you want, but certainly not paints or shampoo. They don't know anything about that. And they have to find it by themselves. And then they, I am their helper instead of being their coach. So it goes even a, a step further because now the person they at stake is, is really the mentor in industry, who is going to hire them at one stage or, or another. Placement, same, plenty of things about placement, I could show a talk to you, but I haven't got time. Um, they are job ready, I've, I've, I've changed that. And I think this is, this is what I want to finish it. In terms of impact, um, they are job ready, they are attendance, my units are amongst those up there. Um, if they miss one thing, this is an assignment that is going up. I, nothing is compulsory. I tell them you, you, you can avoid every of my classes. Okay? If you don't want to be here, you're not here. And then they, they skip one and they come back and say, oh, you skip one, but I'm completely lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bad. <laughs> so then they don't exchange for the one. So even completely at, in the middle of the semester, this, this is the kind of thing. What did I learn? My contact hours are my field of experimentation. So I do, and I'm not going to tell you how many hours I do. So you're going to freak out, but <laughs> <laughs> do a lot. And I want to attend all these, these hours. I want to attend all my cracks, even though they are repeated four times. I want to see in their eyes if it works or not. Um, desirable, indesirable side effects. I really have to think differently. Um, time management for students, they have to learn that. Because when you have to do something really clearly established, it's easy to say, oh, it's going to take me two hours. And that kind of thing, you cannot stop if you want to. The good students don't stop. They come to my office saying, I'm completely overwhelmed. Because I found 50 um, publications. And well, I, wanted, I wanted how many? Five. You wanted five, but I found 50. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, okay. Now you have to learn how to get five, not 50. See? The not good students have other things to think about that, yeah, with this kind of experiential learning and, and, and teaching, we have to think about it very differently. And there are plenty of things that arrive on the way that we don't really know um, initially that we have to deal with. So, inspiration, impact, don't be afraid of setting points, very often. Don't give up, it gets better. Okay, so you start with bad 
Thanks for being here with us today for this last session of the program. My name is Susie Ho and I teach in the School of Biological Sciences. And this is Lynette. I'm Lynette Hendry um, and our co-author is Nikki Lovejet and she's also a TA in the School of Biological Right, so today we'd like to discuss the role, the important role that teaching associates can play in creating more effective prep classes through engaging further with lecturers to provide feedback on students' perceptions uh, in the lab, their experiences and any potential barriers to learning our students may be experiencing. So we're going to run through, oh, that's the, yep, we're going to start that again and this time it'll work. Oh yes, all right, now we're, now we're cooking. Okay, we're gonna run through the importance of the lab experience for students and why rapidly acquiring student feedback on the ground, in the lab, and adapting edu educational programs in a timely manner at the scale of both 11 and then feeding that through to the unit is crucial to improving the lab experience for students. So our approach has been to use a simple iterative feedback model uh, where Lynette and myself and other teaching associates engage with one another. I'm, I'm the lecturer, by the way, I'm the unit coordinator and I work with some wonderful uh, teaching associates in my unit. Um, and so uh, we're able to use this model to adapt content and delivery within the lab in a very timely manner, in a rapid manner. And uh, with a view to feeding this through to the unit level um, through the rich insights that T TAs have to bring. All right, so obviously we all know that laboratory experiences are ranked extremely highly by students. They, a good lab experience generally leads to greater overall student satisfaction in a unit. And this is partly because while some students may not attend lectures, uh, we know most will attend pracs because these are fre frequently tied to assessments. But students also do enjoy the immersive and active learning approaches we tend to find in lab environments. And labs also offer rich opportunities for individual students to interact with educators, both lecturers and TAs like Lynette, allowing feedback to flow from educators to students and students to educators, which is particularly important with 
in terms of what I'm passionate about, uh, which is addressing barriers, uh, recognised barriers to learning through a collaborative approach. So we, I tend to take, well, Lynn and I tend to take a more collaborative approach where we work with the students to reach a set goal together, uh, whether, it, the, whether that is producing a decision for a particular report or the purpose of dissection. So we're often able to rapidly adapt our approach or material to suit the needs of an individual student when we engage with them face to face. We all know that. But how can we somehow use this natural, intuitive, adaptive approach we take with individual students in enormous lab classes? Uh, because we know that many of us, such as Chris, are teaching to labs of 100 students or more. And so this is where uh, our impetus for this model has come from. How can we use the lab as an adaptive environment to better break down barriers to learning like disengagement, anxiety, misinterpretation of uh, content, or a failure to connect or contextualise the lab experience uh, with the corresponding lecture content or the overall uh, or the overarching unit outcomes. And in all of this, of course, the problem we face is although we all deeply wish to know the students, know their progress and their experiences in the lab, we just don't have time to do so. So it can be really difficult to adapt to the needs of individual students or groups, special groups in large classes when lecturers have reduced time for personal interactions. So we do need to encourage students uh, to engage through valuing their feedback and questions by addressing those there and then. So, for example, many students report a gap between labs and uh, the overall unit. So that's a common thing I hear in some classes. So they ask questions such as, how does this lab fit with the lectures? Or which lectures does it fit with? Or what's the point of this particular activity related to this? So these are the questions that require an immediate response. Otherwise, that student won't gain value for the lab, or they may be in danger of being disengaged. So in larger labs, um, I'm not sure what type of uh, lab classes are taught amongst the group out here, but in, uh, in the sciences, often we have really large labs, and the lecturer works in concert with sort of four teaching associates or so, so that we're able to get around to everyone, and, there's, and this sort of facilitates some face-to-face -face teaching. Um, so what this means, essentially, is that teaching associates are uh, the main educators that students actually interact with in a meaningful way. Furthermore, we can have maybe more insight to being a student because we're often not that lost to the students ourselves. And even some students can be intimidated by people like Lex and Susie and more inclined to confide in us about what's not working for them in the course, what they're not learning, what they just can't get hold of. All right, so what this all sort of boils down to is that we, when we undertake an educational action, I suppose, in the lab, when we put something into play, we have to constantly monitor the student's response and adapt appropriately to get the most out of labs. So it's the timeliness of the response. That's very sexy right now, but it's all about the time, timeliness of your feedback and your modification that really improves the student experience. Um, so this helps, that timely response helps students feel valued, labs and uh, learnings are more effective, TAs are better maximised with all their expertise, and there's continual identification and responses to problems when the students are feeding back information to me as, as we're on the ground. So as Lynette said, student responses, uh, students' uh, responses to, uh, to an action in the lab are arguably best rapidly uh, certain and gathered by the TAs, at least in those big, big labs. So teaching associates are definitely more switched on to what the students are experiencing. They may have had time to build up more uh, close relationships with them. 
And in particular, the problems students are facing tend to be directed towards TAs. So if someone's really struggling, they may be nervous about talking to the lecturer, but the TAs are, are more familiar, more friendly, more approachable, and maybe they get that rich information that we really need to grasp. Um, TAs often gain feedback about a lab during a lab. And if I can somehow harness that feedback rapidly, I can adapt to my teaching. So by further engaging with teaching associates, we could uh, also facilitate, as, as Lynette said, informal educational training within the unit, where I can say, Lynette, you did that really well, and she can say to me, oh, you did that badly, and we can somehow both improve over the course of that lab. Um, so I, I believe that process is, is really, really crucial. Um, and, and through that process, I also find out more and more about the teaching associates and their educational expertise and their strengths and their passions. For example, I've been working with someone for quite a while and um, I only recently found out that uh, that person had ESL education training and what's more, they had a real passion for working with ESL students. And of course, once I realised this, uh, that expertise was of enormous benefit to the students when I was able to utilise and showcase it in the lab uh, environment. And the students just really loved that, that they had someone who had such a passion there. All right, so iterative feedback from TAs and two TAs can be used to adapt individual labs as they are running. And that sort of feedback within the lab can then be fed into uh, the unit itself in terms of the logical progression and unfolding of ideas through a sense of, of the way students are handling concepts. Um, and then of course if, if we take a broader view through the experience of teaching associates in, in association with lecturers and unit coordinators we can have a richer development and progression of unit over consecutive years. Okay, let's begin by outlining the, uh, the simple sort of model we use for ensuring we adapt individual labs during the lab period, noting this greater context of uh, moving feedback through to consolidate the overarching unit progression and structure. Okay, this looks a bit overwhelming, especially on a small kind of board over here, but you don't need to read all of this. This is just a bit of an example to show that at the scale of, of uh, an individual lab, this is how Lynette and I approach um, our iterative feedback and adaptive process. We break up the three hour laboratory into time blocks. Uh, for simplicity, up here I've used two teaching uh, time blocks, um, which are sort of shown in, in the light blue, activity one, activity two. Of course, we typically use more. And interspersed between them, you'll note are short meetings between the teachers, the teaching associates and the lecturers. It's as, simple of, it's as simple as that. So some of those meetings are only sort of three minutes. Um, so I was really happy when our wonderful plenary speaker this morning said, sometimes it's the simple things that can be most effective. So this is a very simple thing that I found to be effective, which is touching base with the teaching associates at regular intervals through a lab to see how that section has gone. And that, I address that feedback. This is what the problem was. I hear some of you are dealing with this. I hear people over here are coming up with this great, great idea. Can you share that? Okay, so we're struggling with this concept. Let's adapt it by doing this. And it's talking to students through the process that then gets them onto a group, really gets them onto board and, and helps with a collaborative feel. And then I use sort of the what I'm gaining from Lynette to, to adapt the next section of the prac according to the students' needs. So basically, uh, these little sessions interspersed between, uh, between the student uh, educator blocks are where TAs and lecturers provide feedback to each other and issues are adaptively managed at the start of uh, subsequent teaching blocks. And it's important to, speak, uh, to talk the students through what you're doing there. All right. So I guess to give a little example, if a TA is noticing that, you know, sort of 60% of students are finding an equation really, really frustrating and difficult, at the start of the next teaching block, I'll engage with the students. I'll explain why the task is difficult and why it is worth pursuing. And I'll open up a dialogue between all the teaching associates, myself and the students, and we'll collaboratively, collaboratively sort of move towards that goal of finding a solution together. All right. 
moving along. So those sorts of changes or those sorts of learnings that I gain that are so rich from the teaching associates are then fed through to enhance the cohesion and progression of the unit. Um, so you can do these in a, a number of ways. So students and lecturers can engage on Moodle, on Facebook. I typically do it at the start of the next lecture. And that's where you make links between the prep concepts and the lectures or readdress concepts that obviously haven't been targeted well. Um, and this is where you also must open up dialogue with students about what didn't work in the last lab. And then that gets fed back in to your next lab process. And basically what I have up, up on screen here is just a checklist of the type of questions um, that uh, Lynette and I ask ourselves or I might ask students to get that iterative process happening. In terms of de developing units between years, in fact, teaching associates and lecturers who have good working relationships uh, can, can collaborate extremely, extremely well. So I've informally met to discuss the highlights and low points uh, happening within circles in, in these different levels. And it's really important to give TAs an opportunity to provide input within the curriculum design phase, both for the good of the unit and for the uh, development of the teaching associate. Um, so within these, I wanted to add this in, but it, it just looked too complex. Um, within these sort of iterative feedback process where I gain feedback from Lynette and feed it to the students, there's a, there's a circle going the other way where we're getting uh, feedback from the lecturer through to uh, teaching associates about their practice and then the teaching associate can also bring that to the student about what they could do better. So it flows both ways. All right, overall, even though this is such a simple process, it's something that a lot of us don't do that much. And I believe uh, actually integrating this through, through the vision of uh, some of the wonderful teaching associates I work with, uh, I believe the quality of the laboratory sessions I, I have the privilege to teach into have improved. So our set two ratings have really increased, particularly around feedback and support, with some um, key comments listed here that you'll see around feedback, uh, unit cohesion and structure, and you'll see comments uh, that students are getting report, support from the whole team, so there's a real collaborative team feeling within units uh, that, I, that I think is really important for students. Um, okay. And Lynette might speak a little bit now about uh, what she's found useful in this process for her own development um, as an educator. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Susan talked a lot about collaborative learning and you know, teaching associates coming to you. That's really, really important, it's really vital for, um, from the point of view of each individual um, lab and then onwards to growing careers. So, um, oftentimes, teaching associates will find that they are learning the material just a bit faster than the students, so they're just a little bit ahead of them. Um, and often, the way that the students will be interacting with the material is not necessarily known by the lecturer. So, TAs are really, really important at, at bridging that gap between the two groups. And the collaborative learning um, approach is really important from the point of view of everybody working together towards a final goal, which is good work for the students, so you can really run your unit. Um, so, that's vital. So 
This is about an adaptive, collaborative, and sort of responsive, uh, responsive iterative uh, feedback loop um, that will harness all those insights that Lynette and others bring. Um, so now we'd like to inv invite your questions. Uh, in particular, I'm curious about um, uh, these sorts of processes that you may already sort of use in an intuitive way. So we're really, Lynette and I are trying to semi-formalise what's kind of come up organically in the classroom. So I'd love to hear ideas about how you guys use feedback from teaching associates, iterative feedback in, in particular to enhance your teaching. Um, I'd also love to invite you to uh, harness feedback from a teaching associate. So <laughs> I'm let situation yeah. to be able to do that. I think, I uh, think logistics is going to allow it usually. Yeah, and one, one of the experiences I've had is frequently um, you'll have a meeting at the end of the week to talk about what happened during the week, yeah. and that's great for the following year if you remember it during the practice mm -hmm. session day, but actually the idea of having that meet up in the middle of it is, is far more useful, I think, for a lot of the subjects. It right? really is, yeah, for me. <laughs> <laughs>
I think it will all be recorded. Thanks, mate. Ah, oh, no, well done.